I was trying to get it how I live. I want those dead presidents. I want to pull up, head spin, get it, get fly. I got six jobs. I don't get tired. <laughs> Man, you already know what it is. Jay Williams, let's live life, and we're back. Kevin Gates, you're a whole damn lie. I'm super tired. Now, all jokes aside, blessed to be here. Today is Monday. Happy Monday, 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 beginning of the week. Let's get these videos back out. First and foremost, thank you for everybody that tapped into the lives. Yes, Lord, as Gates would say. I did two lives yesterday. One, where I just dropped the stream yard for everybody, for anybody. Yeah, I think that's what we own. Yeah, that's the best what you about to be off. People say they love their subscribers. They love their viewers. These bigger channels, they're not going to drop their StreamYard link for just anybody to come on. One, because they stand a chance of being exposed by somebody out there. And two, everybody seems to just be worried about views. Nah. Nah, y'all watch me. You're more than welcome to come kick it. So once again, thank you for everybody that jumped into the lives. And if you did not catch both the lives from last night, take some time today to show some love. Go over there and watch the live streams. The last video I did, the whole chow hall incident, I talked about this guy by the name of Chief. Today we are going to tell Chief's story. And I had to get this right last night. Somebody hit me up and said, do not say Indian. It is offensive. We prefer to be called indigenous people. So I'm just gonna say Native Americans, and if that offends anybody, I am sorry. I do not intend to offend anybody. I understand this is y'all's country. You were here first, someone came along and tried to claim it. Never will I take that from you guys. But in today's story, Chief was a Native American. I can tell you the tribe if I think hard enough Pawnee, I believe it was Pawnee, something along that. Anyways, we are going to get into Chief's story. Chief was a big, big, big man. I did not do time with a lot of Native Americans. Virginia does not have a large Native American population when it comes to incarceration. But I did do time with some. And for the most part, the ones I met were either very laid back and stayed to themselves were thorough and for the time you know anytime that it came time to get busy the ones I ran across I had no problem fighting Chief Falls right in that category with all that being said you know how to see it you know how to live it so let's relive it quick recap of the week last week I put in 76 hours at work I got six jobs I don't get tired I don't have the option of getting tired. Even when I get tired, I must push forward. My tribe, my family, my people, the guys at my house, they depend on me. And I have nobody to turn to. So I have to get out there and I have to go get it. I gotta get it to make their life that much easier. And that's what last week consisted of. I did these I did these, these long, long hours. I worked 17 hours one night. The following night, it was 20 hours. And I still took the time to jump on other people's lives in between jobs, doing this, doing that. You're talking one, two, three o'clock in the morning, just trying to show some love. Long, long week. My body is still feeling it. I am not as young as I once was, but I've still got the same drive that I've had since day one. Took some time with the family. Went to Bush Gardens this weekend, Saturday. Terrible. Shame on you people for letting that many people in that park all for a dollar. Shame on you people, man. We drove an hour and seven minutes. The entrance, just pulling in and going to the little booths where you pay for your parking. We have season passes. From the entrance to the time we parked was over an hour. An ocean of cars, as far as I could see in front of me, all you seen was brake lights. Insane. Over an hour in a line to go into a haunted house. And then the average wait times on the rides were 
an hour and a half to two hours. The lines were so long. You're talking an hour to get food. Why did y'all take everybody's money like that, knowing the park was filled to capacity? Thank God nothing happened, because had something happened, somebody fired off a gun in the air, children, people, all types of people would have been trampled to death because the place, the place was packed beyond capacity. Terrible, terrible time. It was a blessing to be able to go out with the family, but the kids look forward to the rides. They're so excited to be in an amusement park, only to get there and thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. When y'all know damn well, y'all should not have let that many people in. And to the people that were running around drinking, acting a fool, y'all need the dog get slapped out of y'all, man. Kids out there and y'all sloppy, drunk, stumbling around, acting stupid. That is my recap of the week. Picking up my son from school. Let's jump into today's video. Now, for you guys that don't know, I love to travel. If you go back and you watch some of my earlier videos, we've got videos from we're out west, New Mexico, California, Venice Beach. I love to travel. One thing I noticed very quickly in being on the West Coast compared to the East Coast was how many Native Americans were out there. A lot. New Mexico has a large, large Native American indigenous people's population. It was beautiful, amazing, to say the least, to see that many together at once. Man, it's not something you see out here. Nobody can really say the last time they seen a whole group of Native Americans hanging out together. Trying hard not to say Indian. I don't want to offend nobody. Being out of New Mexico, I've seen a whole lot of Natives. It was, like I said, amazing. Seeing a whole bunch of full-blooded Indians riding down the highway on old school motorcycles, no helmets, long black hair just flowing in the wind. I'd never seen anything like that except for in the movies. We go back to the days of prison, to the days of incarceration, the days of my stupidity. And I get to thinking about the guys I did time with, Native Americans I did time with. There was a guy named John that was my hawk. He used to look out for me. He was big into the whole... Um, what is Juggalo scene and all the horrorcore rap. But aside from him, there was another dude. And let me paint the picture for the guy that I'm about to talk about that went by the nickname of Chief. He would not be the only native that I ever met with the nickname Chief. I've also heard that is offensive. But that was his nickname. If you walked up and introduced yourself, he introduced himself as Chief. Chief was at the time in the pod I lived in, one of the tallest and one of the biggest men in there. Probably well over 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, 260 if not bigger. Quiet, stayed to himself, didn't bother nobody. Chief, like a lot of the guys in there, had a drug habit. Came to prison behind his drug addiction came to prison behind robbing pharmacies. Chief told me that he went into a pharmacy and like he had done many times before, stuck the place up. But he said he never had to display a gun. He just made them think that he had a gun. On some occasions, he even wrote notes, told them exactly what he wanted them to, to put in the bag. But he goes to rob this pharmacy one day and by now they've shown his picture to all these local pharmacies, letting them know that be on the lookout for this man. He said he did his normal routine. He would come in the store, walk around, pretend he was gonna buy something, wait till nobody was really looking, wake his way back to the pharmacy, and then he would either pretend that he had a weapon or display a note telling them what he wanted. If he didn't display a note, he would pretend he had a weapon and tell them, give me all the oxys, the big bottles, give me the bottles of this, and each time it went off without a hitch. Well, on this day in question, he says he goes in there and he finds out later on that they were on to him. They knew what he looked like. They had surveillance pictures of him. 
he goes in there and before he can make his way back there, he's just inside the store mingling around. The lady in the back goes ahead and gets on the phone and starts dialing the police. He said as he walks up to the counter, she's off to the right beside the register and he overhears her telling him, them, yes, I'm sure it's the man. He's in here right now. Y'all need to get here before he sticks me up. Chief said he wasted no time. Said he jumped, didn't do his normal routine of acting like he had a gun. Didn't do his normal routine of pretending anything or handing a note said he jumped straight over the counter grabbed a girl by the shirt and said take me where the oxys are take me where this is take me where this is at and he grabbed the bag from back there and he started filling this bag up he said on the way out the door customers tried to intervene they tried to stop him and it was an older couple getting in a car next to him that tried to like stop his getaway this old woman like tried to hold his car door shut as he was trying to get in and he said, charge it to whatever you want. I was so amped up that when I snatched the door, she flew across the parking lot. He gets in his car, goes to make his escape, and he doesn't get far before the police box him in. He gets with a whole, hits with a whole pile of robbery charges. And then for the incident with the woman, I think he said he got an abduction charge because he took and physically moved her or was a kidnapper. It was one of the two. He physically moved her from one place to another. So they added on a whole bunch of time for that. Assault, she got banged up, hurt herself, broke something in her arm when she fell. This is a senior citizen we're talking about. The man got so much time that his days of robbing pharmacies or doing anything other than living inside prison were gone. Life as he knows it is now over. He said he thought the courts would have some type of leniency on him due to the fact that he was using this to feed his addiction. Not only was he doing the pills, but he was trading and selling the pills at the time to get dope. This is before fentanyl came along and all this manufactured stuff. This was when heroin was still a thing, when guys could buy heroin and know that it was either heroin or would have cut in it, but they didn't have to buy it and worried about it being straight fent. It was a different time. I meet Chief in 2009, 2010, 2010, because I was in 200 pod at the time, and he slept across the way from me on the top tier, a couple cells down from a guy that I've talked to about before, John Edgar, AKA Too Cool. At first meeting him, he did not speak much, he didn't talk much, the man stayed to himself. I never really had any interactions with him until he wanted to get this tattoo on him, which was related to his tribe, no problem. That's when he gives me the whole rundown on his crimes, what brought him to prison, how all those robberies combined. And if you pretend to have a gun, even if you don't have one, that's an armed robbery. The man was never going home to say the least. In me doing this, and it's, he brought me this, this certain, it was like a, a, a dream catcher, these feathers and all these different things entwined and, and, and woven into this tattoo he wanted, which took up a large majority of this man's arm. I ended up having to redraw this thing three times because his arm was so damn big. And you're talking, this is a big, big tattoo, but when I put it on his arm, it just looked small. So I would get irritated that I had to redraw it. I'd have him come in the cell, I take and put a piece of paper on his arm and it actually took two pieces. I took a sheet of piece of paper and then took another and used some deodorant tape, the sticky tape from the deodorant, put it on there. And I ended up tracing out the shape of his arm and finally getting the pattern right. Well, in sitting in there and tattooing on him, I come to find out that, and this is gonna be hard for a lot of people to believe, this man actually did time with my father. As he's sitting there and I've got him leaned over and I'm me running the gun and wiping and wiping and tattooing. He's looking at the pictures on my wall. And this was during the time of me trying to come to terms with what had happened to me growing up. Me trying to make peace with my father. For, so for like a short period of time, I kept a picture of him on my wall. The only picture that I've ever had of him and I still have to this day, which is at home in my prison photo album. He's sitting as I'm tattooing him and he's, it wasn't uncommon for guys to look at my pictures on the wall, family pictures, children pictures, friends, whatever, cards I got from over the holidays and he's looking and he asked me, how do you know that man? 
and I look at the wall. And usually when somebody would say that, they'd be referencing Philly. Because a lot of people knew Philly from him being locked up. I said, you talking about Philly? He's like, nah. The dude in the top right corner right there. I said, that's my dad. It's your dad? I said, yeah, that's my dad. He's like, well, I did time with your dad. Way, way, way back in the days. Way before I ever caught this case, I did time with him. I said, I ain't doing no time with my dad, man. He's like, I did. He told me things about my dad I didn't know, things that my dad had said, but I didn't know a lot of details. He's like, you know your dad boxed like he was a fighter. I said, yeah, I'd seen him fight in the past. I'd seen him dust some dudes off. He's like, no, he could fight. He used to fight in this thing called the Smoker. Now, Southampton, this is another place. My dad was at Mecklenburg County, Southampton, in the wall. He said, when I did time with him at Southampton, he would fight in the Smoker. And I'm like, well, I'd heard about Smoker. What's the Smoker? Two men got an issue. Instead of stabbing and killing each other, the prison came up with the smoker. The smoker was, on the weekends, they would go inside the ring, and like men, they would put on gloves, and they would handle it. He's like, and I watched your dad fight a bunch of different times. So I thought that was really cool that I was locked up with somebody that had done time with my pops a long, long time ago. Chief goes on about his business. The cellmate I had at the time would get high here and there. I would get high here and there as well when it came to the pills, or I'd pop a pill quick. No shame in my game. I've never been one to snort a pill or shoot no pill or no, I'm not going to all those extremes. I'm just gonna pop it and get the effects from it. But he used to deal with my cellmate on these oxys that he got from this guy that had cancer. If you had cancer at Greensville, you would go to the pill window and they were giving out oxys to these guys that had these these that were terminally ill, that had cancer, that had these certain, you know, issues. And these guys would in turn go sell those pills. Those pills were worth their weight in gold. To get an Oxy-80 and take it back into population, oh, you can bank off of them. But the guy he was getting them from, Chris, did not have an understanding to how much these pills were going for, what they were worth on the streets, and what he could have got for in prison. So he's got a contract where he's selling them to Chief, $20 a piece. Every now and then, Chief was junkied all the way out. He would spend all his commissary and any and every last dollar he got on these pills. He would come to my cellmate and let my cellmate get on from time to time. Get on means let him jump in the loop, let him get in line, let him get the pill because he didn't want the man to start dealing with other people. So before he let him go deal with somebody else and he potentially lose the connect, he come to my cell and be like, damn, man, let me borrow $20. My cell mate be like, hell no. Nah. I know what you need at 24. Let me get the pill. So my cell mate would get the pill. So it was well known what Chief did, what Chief was into. And Chief was on some next level type stuff. Chief was actually shooting these pills. He would put them in a little medicine cup, crush them, and take them to the microwave. And I'm not sure of the entire process. But whatever he did required a medicine cup and him microwaving the hell out of it. Because there was times we'd be waiting on the microwave like, bro, come on, man. And be up there with that pill crushed up inside that microwave, microwaving the hell out of it until he got it to whatever he needed to do to be able to shoot it, right? So at the, at the time, Chief had this younger black dude that was a known gang member in our pod as a cellmate. I told y'all in 2010, this big ass gang thing popped off and a whole bunch of them bloods got scooped up and got shipped all across the state of Virginia to super maxes and higher level prisons. His cellmate fell right in the middle of all that. He gets a new cellmate. The cellmate he gets could not have been a worse cellmate. He gets a cellmate that is into the exact same things he is, that everybody knows, that is always on the yard chasing dope. This dude would buy Thorazine, Trizodone, Seroquel. He was a full-fledged junkie, full-fledged crash test dummy, I mean, just the type of dude that would eat 20 aspirin if he thought he could get high from it, right? And I remember talking to Too Cool, and he was like, oh, this ain't good. And I told you Too Cool was my dude. He didn't live far from Chief. He said, that's not going to end good at all. What you mean? He's like, Chief got a dude in the cell with him that's junkied all the way out. And you know, Chief gets on with Chris that gets the OC, so it's just not going to end good. It comes to a time where Chief stops coming and asking my cell anymore does he want to get it because now his cellmate, which is junkie all the way out, has got a way of maneuvering, getting his people on the phone and having them send money here and send money there. The people, the boys people 
had money. So when Chief didn't have the money to get the pill, his celly would get it. Well, within doing things for people, they start to get entitled. And I know for a fact, I didn't hear it, but I know how the inmate population goes. I know the rules. I know that Chief had to have told the man, I'll let you get it this time, but don't you ever go behind my back and try to set up nothing. Don't try to cut me out the deal, because if you do, there's going to be problems. I've heard that speech said from one man to the next man when it comes to somebody having a plug on it. A time and a time again, if you step on my toes or try to cut me out the picture or go behind my back and cough from him, me and you are going to have problems. So I can always tell when Chief would let his silly get on because the dude was always high. But for some reason, when he would do those 80s, when he would shoot that 80, he would be next level high. I'm talking sitting out on the bench in the day room. The dude didn't have a TV, didn't have no electronics, didn't have no food. Every bit of everything he got went to in the name of getting high. So he would come out and watch the TV in the day room. This dude would come out and sit and watch TV and nod all the way off. Be itching, scratching, taking his towel and running across his back with no shirt. To the point that dudes used to have to tell him, hey man, you're drawing hard, like drawing a lot of attention. Chill out. This had only happened a handful of times. I seen him on maybe, I'd say three, four different occasions, sitting out there doing bleachers, in front of the TV, but not watching the TV, kind of incoherent, just sitting there, passing time, bored, nodded out, doing what he was known for doing. Well, the dude, Chris, that I told you has cancer, it gets worse and worse and worse. This dude was going over, and they were pumping him full of different pills, different narcotics. He would go in the morning, and they give him the Dilaters and an Oxy. Then he'd go at lunchtime, and they give him something else, and then in the evening, they would like double up on certain things to get until breakfast. Chris had cancer. He starts getting sicker and sicker and sicker to the point that they come and get him and tell him, pack up. We're taking you to South South Regional Hospital. He's got to leave the prison and go to the hospital. He had a bunch of these pills saved up. He can't take them with him. They're going to pack his property up chances are he's going to go to the hospital and die which he did go to the hospital and die he never returned he died at south south regional so he comes to chief with these pills here and there over the span of months he's been snagging one putting it aside putting it aside put it aside he's now got a handful of oxys chief doesn't have the money to pay for these oxys so he goes to his cellmate and tells him if you can get the money i can get them cover my half and I'll get it to you when I can get it to you. If he doesn't want to do that, then Chief will just go find somebody else to do the deal. But he wants all the pills for himself. He wants them all to be in his cell. He doesn't want anybody else to get their hands on them. It's just the greed that comes with men. This younger dude makes this thing happen. Somehow or another, he gets his people to do something. And they get, he gets on the phone and they convince his dude, Chris, which they probably never sent him anything because they knew he wasn't coming back. But they convinced the dude, Chris, that, yeah, the money's been sent. Da, 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 you're going to get your money. Don't worry about it. Now Chief's got all these pills. He gaps them up with this dude. Chief had a spot. And I'm not going to talk about the spot because it's a spot that's still used to this day that I've never heard another prison channel talk about. And I would not want to blow the spot up. Chief's got this hiding spot in the cell where he hides everything. And so does the cellmate. So did I, so did other guys. We had this one particular spot that was infamous, like I said, that I've never heard spoke of. Young boy gets his pills, chief gets his pills, everybody's happy. A little bit of time goes by and we start hearing that the two of them aren't getting along. Chief is accusing this dude of stealing. Supposedly chief had put his pills up, young boy put his pills up. Now chief's counting his pills and one of his pills missing. Young and swearing to God, I didn't take your pill. You must have lost it. You must have did it. This, 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 this must have happened. He's not trying to hear it. This is a big commotion they're making in the cell. But in prison, when somebody starts getting loud and something pops off, everybody gets nosy. It can go from being crazy, crazy loud in there. When people hear or see that something's getting ready to pop off, it gets quiet. The room kind of gets the volume turned down because everybody's shh, shh, shh. What are they doing? What they got going on? Everybody calms down so they can hear what's going on. And we hear Chief up there telling this dude, you stole from me. Don't lie to me. 
I'll slap the shit out of you. I'll beat your ass in here. You stole from me. You go give me one of yours. And the youngest telling him, I'm not giving you none of mine. You calling me a thief. I ain't steal nothing from you. It went from the room calming down, us being able to hear what was going on, to them arguing, to it sounding like a construction site up there. The door is closed, mind you now, but there's an open slot cut in the door that you can stick your arm out of. It's maybe 18 inches tall, probably not big enough to put your face through, so maybe five inches wide. We can hear Chief up there, and he's got his hands on his young boy. And at first, there was a bunch of yelling. There was a bunch of screaming. Chief's got him. Where's it at? Where's it at? Where's it at? And it goes from him questioning him, and you could hear the light thuds and the sounds of the punches to it sounded like he was taking this boy's body and trying to knock walls down with it. I mean, you could hear the, the echo off, and they lived on the second floor, so when he would slam this boy, and mind you now, the concrete ceiling that separates the cell upstairs from the cell downstairs has got to be every bit of 12 to 15 inches thick. As he's slamming this boy, you can feel the echo. It's almost like bass inside the pod. And this is a large open room with 43 cells in it, 86 inmates, one guard in the booth. You can literally feel almost like the, the building vibrate from what he's doing to this boy up there punishes the boy, hurts the boy bad. We locked in for count, and as we're locking in for count, we all see the door where Chief's door is not open since this whole situation has happened. We've got maybe 15, 20 minutes before we lock down for count, and that's it. We look up before they call, you know, 20 minutes till we lock down for count, 20 minutes to lock down for count, and we see Chief come out the cell and head to the microwave. He's got that little medicine cup and he's got these pills crushed in it. But there's something very different from every other time than he's ever went to the microwave before. Chief has blood all over the front of his jeans. Chief has blood on his face. There is blood on the side of his neck. There is blood all over his shirt, his hands, his fists, his forearms. It legitimately looks like he cleaned an animal up in that cell, like he butchered some type of animal. The man has blood all over him. And his only concern, I guess he knows he went way too far. He's hurt this boy real bad. There's no hiding it. When the guards come through for count, they're 100% going to see what's going to happen because the man can't stand up. Chief's concern at this point was getting high. He needs to shoot these pills before the guards come in and take him up out of there. Why he didn't just keister him or suitcase him or boof him, I don't know. I'm not Chief. He goes to the microwave for the better part of five, ten minutes. He's at the microwave and... He shoots up to a cell and shuts the door. By now, we all know that when these guards come through for count, all hell's about to break loose. We have not seen sign of that young boy that was just in that cell that was used as a human jackhammer, that sounded like a human ping pong ball, that sounded like a human bowling ball that was being dropped. He had that boy up there like a rag doll, making him touch every wall in that cell. When I tell you, I can't iterate enough or reiterate enough how big Chief was. The man had hands like damn bear claws. If he was reincarnated as some type of spiritual animal, he would be the Yeti. He would be Bigfoot. He was a ginormous man. To take a punch from him would probably fracture your entire face. He could take the average man, pick him up by his throat like Jason in a horror movie, and just hold him in the middle of the air like there was no problem. Chief goes on in the cell. We all know what he's doing. He's going to get high. He goes in there... I guess he does his shot, and I'm on the bottom tier, so they come by my cell, and when they go by my cell, then they have to go up the staircase, and they start at, you know, the first cell here, and they work their way all the way back down. They get over to where Chief's cell is, and I see them walk by, and they back up, and they lean towards the door, and they say, hey, you need to get up off the bunk and stand for count. Chief has got his back turned to him. No response. Hey, hey, cell such such, you need to get up off the bunk. And stand for count. No response. Third time we're telling you, comply with what we're saying. Get off the bunk and stand for count. And if not, you will be charged. We're going to stop count. You're hindering and delaying count. We're going to call officers in. Get up off the bunk and stand for count. The man doesn't move. They go to radio, and I don't know what Chief said. Maybe he told them he ain't getting up. Maybe he told them he can't move. Maybe he told them... I broke him up real good. But whatever he said, it took the guard from radioing to starting to stare through the cell. 
They go ahead and radio and they stop count. Another guard comes in and goes with that second guard and they go on about finishing count. And the first officer of that chief said whatever he said to stayed there until the sergeant the lieutenant showed up. They opened the cell door. No sooner they opened the cell door, the first thing they did was handcuff chief and bring chief out the cell. Chief is got shortcut hair because we couldn't have long hair at the time. So picture a man of that size, really dark complexion when it comes to, to being a Native American man. Strong, squared off jaw. It's not racist. Don't hate me. I'm just trying to describe what the man looks like. And he's standing there up against the wall, cuffed up, covered in blood. And he's so high that he's just kind of like leaning his head on the wall. The guards are talking to him and asking him what's happened. And he's not saying nothing. He's just, I don't know how many of those OCs he did. I don't know if he had some left and did his. Or if after he just crushed this young boy, he just took his and, and went and did them. They take Chief up out of there. They don't move this boy. This boy is hurt to the point that. They're afraid to put him on a board. They're afraid to do anything. After Chief messed him up, he took him and just put him back on the bunk and covered him up with a blanket. In a matter of three to four minutes, it went from being two officers in their accounting to upwards of probably 30, 40 officers, medical, different nurses, doctors, higher ups. When I say higher ups, I mean people that really had power within the prison are all outside this cell. They've done led Chief off to the hole. They stayed in that cell for a while before they finally got that boy onto a board, up and out of there. And that would be the end of that whole situation. We come to find out Chief broke his arm, several of his fingers, fractured his skull, uh, did all types of messed up stuff. He, they said that he had dropped him on a stool, possibly broke his back. And we had a dude in my pod at the time that worked in the infirmary that come back and told us, like, the dude was out at the main hospital for a long time, for like several months before he returned back to prison. And when he came back to the prison, a young dude, that's when the dude that worked in our pod, that worked in the firm, returned and said, yo, he about killed that dude. Like, he messed that dude's brain up. That dude's not talking. He's in the infirmary. They're sp uh, spoon feeding him and changing his diapers. And he's, he's not the same. Chief pretty much beat that boy in the cell to the point that he left him mentally disabled. Here's the sad part about all that. You would think after that happened to that dude that with him not being all there no more and not able to take care of himself that he would go ahead and go home. No. They ended up sending him off to a prison that could deal with guys that had more serious medical needs, more serious medical issues, where whatever sentence he had, I didn't know a lot about this dude and don't to this day, other than, that, other than Chief damn near killed him and left him brain damage in the cell. But they didn't let the man go home after what Chief did to him. They shipped him off to another prison where there was more people to take care of him and he would stay and serve out the remainder of his sentence. I didn't foresee that coming when it came to Chief. I knew that with that man being that damn big, and being quiet the way he was, that he was dangerous. It's the quiet guy, the guy that doesn't say much, the one that always stands back and watches everybody else that a lot of times you need to be concerned about. You know what can happen with this guy and that guy because you've seen what they do time and time again. And with the guy that's always loud, you know what he's known for doing. With Chief, he was so big accompanied with the quietness that it made the man almost just scary in being around. When I tattooed on him, I remember as I was stretching the skin on his arm, just thinking, damn, this dude is huge. Like his chest, like just looking at him sideways, this man had to be this wide. Tells me about the, the robberies at the pharmacies, him being Pony Indian, talks about his family members and how he wished he could go back and do this again. Talked about his addiction and how he started getting high and the things he did in prison. And we really didn't have many conversations after I did that tattoo on him. The most I would really hear him say would be when he would come by the cell and kick it with my cellmate and make a little transaction with him. This all goes back to a couple different things. One, not getting locked up. Two, I've told you, leave the drugs alone. Watch the people you're around. 
the sad part is, is that none of us really believe that that boy took anything from Chief. We think that Chief got high and miscounted how many he had left and then accused this boy of doing something that he didn't do. I don't care how crazy you are. To steal from a man of that caliber would be suicidal. Not to mention the young boy still had some pills of his own. So what would he have to gain by stealing from this man that could easily beat him to death? That was somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's nephew, somebody watching maybe related to the man I'm talking about. And on DOC's behalf, now nah, you're not going home. I've told you before, when they send you, they send you. And you will not come home until your sentence is done. And the only way you're going to come home early is if you come home in a bag. So yeah, that was Chief's story and the story of the missing pill. I can only imagine what he did to that boy. I've seen men that big flip out before, freak out before, and it's always a bad, bad thing, especially because nine times out of 10, it's not somebody that big going against somebody of the same size. It's usually a guy that big going on somebody half their size, and this dude was lucky if he was half of chief size, man. It's Monday. I'm now home. I'm going to get inside the house. I hope y'all enjoyed today's video. More videos on the way. Look for more lives. Make sure you go back and recap last night's lives. I love all y'all. I hope y'all have an amazing week. Let's get this week underway. But anyways, these jails, institutions, these detention centers, these prisons, they're all just crazy worlds inside of a already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. And to all my real ones. And the awesome real ones watching. Because y'all still watching me. Man, y'all know how we do. Salute. I don't even think he took that damn pill. That was a big, big man.